We like to keep it scriptural, right? And we welcome everybody out there in internet land. Glory to God that uh, is aware of what's going on tonight. Are we on, CJ? We're on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody got a re- just a real quick popcorn, you know what a popcorn testimony is? You just pop up like popcorn and give it, and then you pop back down. <laughs> Brian. I've noticed that the Lord keeps on answering all of our prayers. Every prayer that we prepare for Every prayer. Praise the Lord, brother. That's good. That's a good testimony. Every prayer you've been praying is being answered. Anybody else real quick? What's that? Real quick, hurry. Praise the Lord. That's good. Yes. Praise God. Pam, do you have one real quick? Um, we've been having that atmosphere. Yeah. I think where I run in a few days or so ago, I, I heard some banging and throwing stuff. Then Danny and I went to walk around my block because it was I could see part of what was going on behind me. Hmm. And the next day when I got up, there is a difference in the atmosphere. Hmm. Really? And it's not on either side of me when you go down the next two blocks. Hmm. Either way. And so I believe there's things changing. Amen. Amen. You have a have authority in your own neighborhood. That is for sure. Praise God. Amen. Well, let's agree in prayer. Father, thank you. Holy Spirit, uh, we open to you as the teacher of the church. We open our hearts. We desire wisdom. We desire revelation. We know we need to walk in your uh, wisdom and your revelation. And so, Lord, I know that uh, you've given me this message to share with your people. It's been stirring in me now for a couple of weeks. And I pray, Father, that uh, you'll just hide me from my inadequacies as a human, and that you'll say your words through my mouth, and that you'll speak also directly to your people as you live and dwell in them. But may we leave this place tonight with your wisdom and your revelation to walk in your light, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Also, I might just add Mike, what Mike was saying about the schools. Uh, several years back, we had a meeting at South High, the ministerial, uh, all the churches in town, Church of Madeira meeting, in the gymnasium. And while we were sitting there, I remember the Lord spoke to me, and he said, there's going to be a major revival in this school. And uh, I've never forgotten that. I've shared it with a couple other ministers. And, uh, you know, uh, I know that there'll be a revival citywide, but I remember him specifically telling me that there was going to be a major revival in South High. So when you said that tonight, it just brought that back to me. And I fully agree. Grab your Bible and turn over to 1 Corinthians 14. I want to talk to you tonight. Actually, I've got a title for this one. CG will be happy. I don't have to try to figure out a title at the end of the message. The title of this is, it's kind of a long one, CJ. You got your pen ready? It's uh, fruit of peace or spirit of confusion. Fruit of peace or spirit of confusion. This started out with just, I was stirred to study confusion in the Bible. Because if there's anything that's happening in the world today, it's confusion. Confusion. And uh, so I, I just felt like we need to address it. You know, people my age, sometimes we kind of forget that... Um, Back in the 50s and 60s, before we started losing our minds in this nation and going crazy and, you know, just throwing away all of the stuff that was the foundational stuff of our society and both spiritually and in other, other ways, uh, some of us remember that somewhat normal balance of life that we had spiritually and naturally. But uh, we don't realize many times there's a couple of generations, two or three generations that have been born into a nation 
that has been confused. And a lot of confusion. And we're really starting to see the fruit of that confusion now. We're at a point now where people don't even know what sex they are. When you can't figure out by looking what sex you are, you are confused. Now, I don't mean that in any kind of, you know, put down or attack somebody or insult somebody. But that is obvious. Amen. As a matter of fact, all right, Lord, you're going to get me in trouble, aren't you? As a matter of fact, the first mention in Scripture, the law, how many of you know about the law of first mention in Scripture? When you see a word and it's mentioned for the first time in Scripture, it's not just that, that the first time it's mentioned, but it's actually setting a precedent for you to see that word in the light of the, the context that it's mentioned throughout the Bible. Now, of course, the word confusion could you know, talk about many different areas. But usually there's a revelatory Hebrew root revelation that uh, shows us the basis for that word as we read it on into, uh, uh, in the Bible. And the word first uh, mention of confusion is in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23. And it's talking about, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to gross you out here tonight, but we got to talk about this. It's talking about bestiality. For human beings to have sexual relations with an animal, it, it calls it confusion. Now you look at the word confusion in the Hebrew, and it means mixture. It means to take things that shouldn't be mixed together and mix them together. That's confusion. That's what causes confusion. You know, you take oil and you take water, and you mix them together, you better not put that oil in your car. And you better not drink that water. Why? Because there's been a mixture uh, out of the divine, it's broken the divine order of God, and it's, it's brought confusion. And so the first mention of that, and the, even the second mention of it, uh, is uh, out of the same uh, book, Leviticus, Leviticus 20, verse 12, and that's speaking, that scripture is speaking of fornication between a father-in-law and a daughter-in-law. I know this is gross, but th those are the first two scriptures in the Bible that speak of confusion. So we see here where the word confusion, the, the precedent that the Holy Spirit set for teaching this in the word, had to do with a sexual nature. And if you read Romans chapter 1, where humans begin to reject the divine order of God and they begin to worship birds as if they're God. They begin to worship the earth. They worship themselves and all of that. We find that that, that comes out of or is intermingled with men having sexual relations with men and women having sexual relations with women. That is confusion. Homosexuality, and I'm not against anybody who struggles with homosexuality. I love them. God loves them. God wants to help them in their life. He doesn't want, you know, he's not throwing them away, trashing them, any of that kind of stuff, and we shouldn't either. But God wants us to understand, if we read Romans chapter 1, that when you see these kinds of things happening, it's a message to you that your society is in a position not of clarity, but confusion. Now, I know that's not politically popular. I know that I would be called a hater and a homophobe and all of those kinds of things, but I love people too much not to tell them the truth. I don't want to stand on Judgment Day and watch people go to hell because I didn't want to be uh, criticized a little bit or rejected or hated. Amen? Really, somebody that hates you is not going to tell you the truth. Moving right along. Amen? So we see this where this word, uh, it has that strong connotation of mixing. Now, uh, it actually, let me just uh, read the definition here that I, I got out of the, the Hebrew. Mixture, unnatural. The root means to mix things together that shouldn't be mixed. I wrote it kind of out in my words, so... Even I could understand it. Because I'm a lot better at reading, writing than I am writing, reading, or whatever. Anyway, no longer pure. It means to be no longer pure, or normal, or good, or profitable, or in divine order. 
So that's, that's what confusion is according to the Bible. Now, I had you turn here to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, there's a number of places the word confusion is used in the Bible. But this is, uh, of course, where Paul in this chapter and in this area of Scripture, he's addressing the church at Corinth because these guys, you talk about Pentecostal, Holy Ghost, Charismaniacs, they were into it, brother. They were into the gifts of the Spirit. God, Paul said to them, you guys don't come behind or come short in any gift. He said, the gifts are flowing through you, man. You're open to the Spirit of God. He's using you. And so God had him write them a letter, a pastoral letter, an apostolic letter to define the gifts and to show them how that if the gifts aren't done in a motivation of love, and you know all the teachings, if you've been in the Pentecostal or charismatic circles for very long, you've heard a lot of teaching and preaching come out of these, these areas. But here in chapter 14, he is primarily addressing the order of a, a, a service that they were in. Because they were having non-Christians come in, and some of them would just speak in other tongues for the whole service. And even the whole congregation would start speaking in other tongues. And these people are standing there going, what meaneth this? These people are nuts, and leave. And so Paul wrote them a letter and just said, there's an order to this. And he said, if there's not a prophetic word that comes forth after the, if it's a message in tongues, there should be a, an interpretation or a prophetic utterance of some kind to bring understanding. And he says, God will even use this to expose the hearts of people so that they will say, God is in you of a truth. God's in this place, not these people are nuts. Amen. And so he was bringing order to this because there was spiritual confusion that was happening in the church. But look here at uh, verse 33. Now let's just say, read verse 32. It says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You know, when you hear somebody say, I just couldn't help speaking in tongues. Oh, yes, you could. You still are sovereign over your own being. Amen. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of, say it, confusion. But what he, is he the author of? Peace. Peace. This is the Greek word irene, which means undisturbed composure. It's a place you come into because the peace of God has worked. The powerful force of the peace of God, that same powerful force that shut down that storm when Jesus spoke to it, he released peace into that. The spiritual force of peace. And this, the peace went out and warred against the storm, grabbed it, brought it back, brought the weather back into order. And so they could just sail along and enjoy the ride to the other side instead of drowning in the ocean. Amen? So he is the author of peace in all the churches, of all the saints. That must mean us too. Amen? Praise God. So... The word confusion, I gave you the Hebrew definition of the word confusion. Uh, this word in the New Testament, because it's in the Greek, the definition of this word confusion is this. Because, and it takes on a little different connotation because, it's, because the New Testament's always written in light of the, of the body of Christ. Amen? Everything that's in the New Testament, you always keep in the back of your mind, he's talking about the body being the body. Jesus is the head in heaven, and we are connected by, to Jesus by the Holy Spirit, but we are the corporate body, and each one of us have a part or a place or a ministry in that body. And so there needs to be not confusion in the body, but there are rebellion in the body. That's what cancer cells are naturally. They are rebelling against the normal order of cells and they're growing too fast and doing things independent on their own, and they're, they're hurting the body. Right. Amen? Right. So it's a body, you have that body mentality, that, that understanding, that comprehension of what needs to be. So even this definition, we are to see it in that context. The New Testament words means to not be set in, in your place. Confusion. To not be set in your place. That sounds like a body... Terminology, doesn't it? To be out of order. It also, it, it's, it's, a, it's translated, the same Greek word in the New Testament is translated in the English Old, Old King James Version of the Bible in places as tumults. Tumult, a tumult. You know what a tumult is? 
It's like a riot. It's confusion. You know, this group's over here, there's this big thing going on, and these people are yelling this, and these people over here are yelling something else, and it's, a, it's just this confused mass mess. The devil wants the body of Christ to be a confused mass mess. And he works hard every day to try, try to get that to happen. That's why he attacks you and I in our minds, is he wants us to disconnect from who we are in the body and what we're to be and how we're to be so that we can start something that's going to bring confusion to the body. And when you look up, the, when you study the Bible, you see that when people are in one accord, when they're not confused, when they're in one accord, when they're in their place and they're serving God with the right heart motive in that place, that that's when harmony and peace and power is poured out. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. So Paul was, he used the term confusion here to help the church be in divine order uh, where... Uh, spiritual gifts and manifestations of the Spirit were concerned. But now let's turn over to James chapter 3. Just hang in here with me tonight. James chapter 3. The book of James has been called the New Testament book of Proverbs. And I agree with that. If you, you read it, it, you know, Proverbs is all those, just those wise sayings that just bring you into a place of understanding. And the book of James is the same type of writing. Now, here in the book of James, um, let's go ahead and start at chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. Basically, he's just saying, don't force yourself into a position of authority in the body of Christ or try to assume a position God hasn't called you to or set you in because when you step into that role, you're going to receive, you're going to have to match up to that role. You're going to receive judgment based on the role you're standing in. Remember Aaron, he was the high priest. His sons were priests as well, but they weren't the high priest. God hadn't given them that position yet. But they, well, hey, we're priests. You know, he goes into the Holy of Holies, uh, you know, into the presence of God. We can too. Well, they put the incense on their, uh, what do they call those? Censers. And they went in and tried to go in, and the judgment of God consumed them. They were consumed by the fire of God. It's a dangerous thing to intrude into an office you're not called to. Now, God's merciful. Don't get me wrong. God's not just waiting for somebody to make a misstep and zap them. But at the same time, should I go off on this rabbit trail? All right, real quick. Brother Hagen, years ago, I remember him. You know, they used to have healing school on the campus of Ramah. And four or five days a week, they would teach on healing. They would pray for people. And there, were two, there was a husband and wife team that were in full-time ministry that were at this healing school. And they both had a terminal disease. He had known them for years. And he, he taught all week. But he said, I could tell we weren't making progress with them. And he said, I walked in the back of the building one day while worship was going on, and he said, my heart just broke. And he said, I began to cry. And I began to say, God, why can't I help those people? And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said this. He said, I can't help them, so you can't help them. He said, what do you mean? He said, I didn't call them to do what they're doing. They pressed into it, pushed in it on their own, and they won't listen to me. They're rebellious against me. And so, as the scripture says, after many years, I've been forced to judge them and turn them over to Satan for the destruction of, their of the flesh so they don't lose their salvation on the day of judgment. Do you know that's in the Bible? You don't hear much teaching on it, but it is in the Bible. So, I'm not saying don't step out and be bold in God. Don't get, don't get me wrong. But I, but I hear people sometimes calling themselves things, and sometimes I cringe. Yeah. Not that I know it all, or I'm Mr., you know, know who everybody is in the body of Christ. But, this, you know, you can have a witness in the spirit sometimes. You know, there's some people that are just baby Christians, they're young Christians. You know, just like a little kid that thinks he's Superman. We know he, he's not Superman. God knows he's not Superman. And God knows that even if he thinks he's Superman, he's just young and ignorant and doesn't know. So there's, a, there's some of that in the body of Christ too. And God just winks at it, overlooks it. But there are other things where people can actually push into something 
and they can become obstinate, and they're not listening to God. It's kind of the opposite of not doing what God's telling you to do. You can get in trouble that way, too. That's how I got in trouble, was running from my call for 16 years. But there's another side to it, too. And, you know, people, they, they get these ideas about ministry. Oh, you know, if I was just an apostle or a prophet. What they don't realize is that's a job description. That's not some crown on your head so people can worship you and think you're just a wonderful whatever. All right, done on that rabbit trail. Let's get back over here. But see, that can bring confusion to people's lives. Sad part about it is it can bring confusion to the church. And that's what uh, James is addressing here, the day that God has to say no more of that. Because when a person's out of place and not standing in the right office, they're going to lead people out of place and cause them to miss God too. Paul said, knowing the goodness and the severity of God, we warn men. Hallelujah. Verse 12 for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man or a mature man, mature person, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn, their, uh, they, we turn about their whole body. Also, behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven with fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth or the captain desires, in other words. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Now, I know you've heard much teaching on the tongue and on the mouth and confession and speaking things, but let's, let's keep looking at this for a minute because it's going to play right into what we're talking about tonight. Verse 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. You know what the, the iniquity is? It's lawlessness. Me and my big mouth. <laughs> Just me, John Purcell, speaking out of his little peanut brain computer here and trying to judge things and judge people and judge myself, you know, in, in, in one sense or one way. We are to judge our own heart motives. But many times we don't even know who we are. Well, let's just keep going here. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the wheel, or the course, of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. What kind of fire burns in the course of nature? Hell fire. There's three kinds of fire. There's the fire of God, which purges, cleanses, blesses us. There's the natural fire we warm our tootsies by in the winter. And then there's hell fire that is destructive. And this world, because of the enemy, and sin infecting this world. If we just go with the flow of this world and just live a natural life out of our head without letting Jesus be Lord over our life, then we are going to use our mouth to set a forest fire that's going to consume us and probably people around us. A spiritual fire. James is writing to the church here, by the way. For every kind of beast, verse 7 and birds, and serpents, and things of the sea, is tamed, and hath been tamed by mankind. Every morning when I get up, my fat weenie dog's sitting right there looking at me like, when are you going to eat? Because then I get a bite. <laughs> I don't know whether I've trained her, or she's trained me, but anyway, she's there. Verse 8, but the tongue can no man tame. It is, no man can tame it. Aren't you glad that the Holy Ghost can tame it? The tongue can no man tame, it is of unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith, or with the tongue, we bless God. Oh, I praise you, Lord, I bless you, you're so wonderful. I give you my life, I give you my heart. Amen? And even the Father, and therewith, or with the tongue, we curse men, we curse people. We criticize, we judge, we attack. We get mad and call them names. I've been guilty of all of that. And had to repent. Thank God for 1 John 1, 9. Hallelujah. Maybe you got your flesh completely in subjection. Mine's not quite there yet. I know yours is not either. So it gives me hope. Therewith curse we men, even which, uh, which are made after the similitude of God. Notice how he frames this. I love this. 
He pictures men in the similitude of God. He says, you've got to see men like you see God. Not that make them God, but you see them after the way God sees them. You've got to get God's opinion. You've got to see it from God. When I first started to pastor, it didn't take me long to figure out, number one, I didn't know what I was doing. Number two, God, if I'm going to, because I knew my job, my ministry was to help you find yours. And for you to be that reproductive sheep of God, blessing the kingdom and, and doing all. But if I don't know who you are, how am I going to help you become who you are? How am I going to be able to pastor you and always help you, you know, to lead and to feed, to direct you toward what God's made you to be? So I started praying, God, help me. <laughs> help me not to be judgmental. Help me not to just see them for their humanity and their faults and their failures and my high, you know, highfalutin pharisaical opinions. And, and you know, it's amazing when you ask, like, like our brother was saying about answering prayer, when you ask God stuff like that, he'll start doing it. He'll start showing you who somebody really is. I'm glad that Karen and I learned that about our kids when they were younger. Instead of just, well, you're like Uncle so-and-so. He was an idiot and so are you. People do that. You're probably going to end up in jail just like him. Now, I'm not saying I didn't ever say anything out of line to my kids. I have and had to repent too. But I, we ask God to show us who are they. Who are they in the spirit? See, the similitude of God. What part are they to play in the body? Who are they? So we could pray that over them, speak that over them. Not tell them, I'm not the Holy Ghost. I would teach them, train them, try to teach them and train them as best I could in the things of God. But it's up to God to tell them who they are. And that's like you've heard Mike tell that testimony. We were on that trip in Missouri, and all of a sudden he scared me so bad I almost ran off the road. <laughs> Driving down the road, going to the airport, and he goes, Dad, like, what? <laughs> I thought somebody was getting ready to hit us or something. He says, I just heard the voice of God. He called me into the ministry. I'm going, yeah. Yeah, I knew that. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's like, you know, I, I think he was kind of surprised I didn't, like, get all excited. But I already, I'd already heard it years before. But I didn't tell him because I didn't want him going into the ministry because I told him. And I didn't want him, once he got in the ministry and got attacked by the devil, and the devil was telling him he wasn't a minister, that he'd have these thoughts, well, I did this because my dad told me. I wanted him to know he'd heard from God. Yeah, amen. amen? I think I'm still on a rabbit trail, and I'm trying not to be. Anyway, let's get back over here. Verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. That sounds like mixture to me. That sounds like confusion to me. Corn fusion. Corn fusion, that's right. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? It's impossible. Amen? You're going to get bitter water, not sweet, when you mix the two. Amen? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? No, because there's a divine purpose. There's a DNA in that tree. There's everything's in that tree to bear figs, not olives. Amen? Either of vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. So he's addressing the issue here of confusion, and he's, he's amplifying or he's signifying our tongue as being a major player, a major agent in that. Now, back over in chapter 1, just hold your place here, but flip back over to chapter 1. <clears throat> James 1, yeah, I'm sorry. James 1. I thought I wrote the verse down. Yeah, here it is. No, that's not it. Yeah, here it is. James 1, 26. If any person among you who seem to be religious... Now, of course, we've kind of made the word religious a bad word nowadays. And we mean dead religion, dead works, and all that when we use it. But religion, being religious is not wrong. Being religious, it even defines what good religion is in this book. It's to be sincerely committed to be a blessing to the widows and the orphans. It's, you know, being religious about that. That's a good thing, to religiously do that. But he says here, if any person among you seems to be religious, and what? 
bridleth not his tongue. He ex explained that over in, in chapter 3 about bridling the horse. What do you put a bridle on a horse for? So you can turn that horse. You use the bit in his mouth. That bit is a little bit painful when you pull on it, and that horse will turn his whole body when you, you pull on those reins with that bit or that bridle uh, on the horse. Amen? But bridleth not his tongue. You're going to have to make your tongue say what it's supposed to say, is what he's saying here. But let me read this, the rest of this verse. But bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is in vain. Now he's saying here that, and it goes back and connects with chapter 3, of course, or is more amplified in chapter 3. He's saying here that what we say out of our mouth is going to plant our heart. The sower soweth the word, Jesus said. Who's the sower? God. Who lives in you? God. And so if you let the Holy Ghost dictate your words, you're not only saying those words to God or releasing them out this way, you're also saying them to your own heart. Have you ever been around what they would call a uh, clinical liar? Or what's the word? What's the uh, pathological liar? They actually believe stuff that's obviously untrue. You know why? They've defiled their heart with it. They've told it, they've said it to people so many times, said it to themselves that they've actually planted confusion, confused mixed seed in their own heart, and now they can't even tell the truth from a lie, and so they tell this stuff, and they, they actually think it's true. That's strong delusion, all right. <laughs> that is being deluded. Amen? So he's saying here that we have to understand that this confusion issue that we can't mix our opinion, the devil's lies, what mama said that you know is not in line with the word. That's why it's so important to study the word. The word draws that line, man. Praise God. You know, you need to teach yourself. The first thing you ask yourself when you have a thought or somebody says something or something happens, what does the word say about that? Amen, because it divides it, and I, if something happens, even something I don't understand, I don't accept that as God or as God's will even, if it doesn't line up with the Word. I may not understand the whys and wherefores, but I don't build doctrines on things I don't understand. Amen? That's how doctrines of men and doctrines of devils get in the church, is because the enemy brings confusion, and he mixes man's ideas and God's ideas together, and it neutralizes the power of God and actually brings confusion to people's lives. Right. <coughs> right. Hallelujah. Well, let's go back over to chapter 3. We've got ourselves in. Now let's get ourselves out. What do you say? Verse 13. Who is a wise person, a man or person? And endued with knowledge among you. Let him show out of a good conversation, which means what you say and what you do, lifestyle, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. See, that's that, what he was talking about in chapter 1. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, don't start sowing lies. Don't start sowing lies in your heart. See, you can never even open your mouth and have a conversation with your own heart. We do it all the time. We're all self-talkers. We all talk to ourselves. We all go, you know, let's just say somebody did something wrong to you or offended you and you're just, well, you know, that's not right and they shouldn't have done that. And I just know, I, you know, I know they did that because they wanted to hurt me. And they, they probably, you know, I bet they even talk to that person. You, know, you can just go and 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 go. You can go into demonic Disneyland with all of that. And be in Never Never Land, where never, it's not, never anything good's going to happen. And the whole time, you're, you're sowing it in your own heart. Just realize, you and I are not smart enough to figure it all out. 
you come up with some standard that you think is right, and because somebody else doesn't live by that standard, you start attacking them, you're more wrong than they are. Hallelujah. So he says, let's go back to verse 13 here. Let's, let's hit on this part first. Who's a wise man endued with knowledge? Now notice, he says, a wise person is going to have knowledge first. See, you've got to get the divine order in your life. You know, I was sharing this with Michael. We were talking about this before the service tonight. Some thoughts I had this morning while he was preaching. And, is that, you know, when Solomon, when, Solomon's known for what? Wisdom, Right? Solomon was raised in the palace. David was his dad. He watched all the goings on. He watched his dad uh, bring the glory of God upon the nation. He watched his dad pile up so much riches uh, that, you know, they, they uh, had enough to build the glorious temple. He watched him succeed as king. He watched him do all of these things. So it would have been real easy for Solomon to get into assumption and presumption. To assume, well, I watched my dad do this. I see how he does it. I know how to do this. But see, the thing that, that we don't understand about that kind of thing is that David had a certain specific job and ministry to do, and Solomon's was a little different. David went to God and said, I want to build the temple. God said, no, you shed too much blood. But I am going to let you bring the glory back into the city. I am going to give you that, that victorious place where you can heap up the riches and, and bring in all the spoils of war and all that. I'm going to let you prepare for the temple to be built. That's who you are. Yes. Now, if Solomon would have tried to fall in line and just presume to do things the way David did, he would have missed his whole calling. He understood. Thank God he was wise enough at that point. And, you know, David started instructing him over there in, in Proverbs 3. That's David writing to Solomon in Proverbs 3. And he says, my son, attend to my words. Incline your ears unto my saying. And he started pointing him toward, go after wisdom. Go after wisdom. Go after wisdom. Yeah, you have knowledge. You see how the kingdom thing kind of operates. And you've seen me even operate and, and connect with God and his glory and his blessing and all of that. And victory in battle and, and heaping riches. But you need to get the wisdom and the knowledge you need for who you are in your generation. And I'm convinced that's why when it was time, Solomon went up there and he killed a thousand animals and shed their blood as a sacrifice. He was saying to God, Moses said in the word that he would bless us to a thousand generations. It's my turn with my generation. And so I'm stepping out in faith and I'm placing a demand upon you to give me what I need to do so I can serve the people as king. Amen. He had that meek, humble attitude. But he also was putting a demand on God. And that night, God showed up in his bedroom and said, what do you want? How would you like for God to show up in your room? Say, uh, hey, John, what do you want? See, he, he doesn't show up in people's lives and say that unless they do what Solomon did to begin with. Solomon had put him in, himself in a position where God could trust him enough to ask him that question. Lord, I don't want to be just a big shot king. Here I am sitting on the throne with the crown and I'm telling everybody what to do. I know that you've given me, me these people to serve. Exactly. Amen. And I, I don't know what I'm doing because it's my turn, but it's different than my dad in some ways. Yeah. And so he sought the wisdom of God. So we get that wisdom. Notice this verse 13. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge? We get the wisdom and the knowledge of God by, by approaching him, listening to him, asking him to talk to us and give us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need. Yeah. Then we can be zealous with the wisdom and the knowledge. Yeah. You know, even little children, they get excited, you know, about something and they run off in their zeal and try to do things they can't do. Right? right? And we do that in the church. We're excited. You know, when you first got saved, you're witnessing to everything that moved and some things that didn't. Yeah. Amen? 
And, you know, and God blessed your efforts and he, you know, and all that kind of thing. And, but there's a balance in that. Mike was talking about it this morning, how that we learn to listen to the Holy Ghost. Jesus walked past the man at the gate beautiful for three and a half years and never even said anything to him, apparently. Because the Holy Spirit didn't say, say something to him. The Holy Spirit didn't prompt him to do that. Amen? And that's not an excuse to not minister to people. But it is learning to take your zeal and subject it under the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Yeah. Glory to God. Amen? Amen? So who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of, his good, out of a good conversation, a good lifestyle, his words, work, his works with meekness. Everybody say meekness. Meekness of wisdom. Meekness of wisdom. Praise God. Uh, the word meekness here actually means humility. The word humble means to, here you are, here's the body of Christ, and here you are, it's, it means to find your spot under the head, Jesus. Where do I belong in the body? You come in under the head. You let God tell you. And if you don't know who you are, I have people tell me all the time, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know who I am. Well, I'll tell you this, you're a child of God, and if you'll just start following Him, listening to Him, loving Him, worshiping Him, you'll begin to come into a comprehension of what's operating and flowing through you, gift-wise and anointing-wise in the body of Christ, and you'll begin to have a heart for certain things. You're, what you're doing is you're finding that position under the head in the body, and as you plug into that place, then as the oil flows from the high priest's head down through the garments, it comes down and reaches you because you're humble now. You're meek. Moses, it says, was the most meek man on the face of the earth. Now, you go back to 40 years old. This was at 80 we're talking about. You go back to 40 years old. He wasn't the most meek man on the face of the earth. He was like all the rest of us. He tried to do his life and his ministry in his own understanding and ended up killing somebody. Amen? But he went through a process where he began to understand. At first, it was a hopeless process. He had to come to that place to find out he couldn't do it at all in his own strength. And when you find that out, it's like, oh, you know, I can't do anything. God, I can't even talk. I, I was there. I can't be a preacher. I can't. But then he takes you through a process, and he begins to show you who you are, and that he's going to do it through you. You're not going to do it for him, and all these kinds of things. And as you plug into that, then... Instead of you taking the wisdom and the knowledge and the anointing and the power and whatever you have and using it on your own, you are in that, that submitted position to where the anointing can come to you, his voice can come to you. There's this cooperative moving with the head and with the rest of the members of the body, and it accomplishes the glory of God. Yeah. You know, when, Mo, when they would insult Moses, when they would falsely accuse him, when they would this, when they would that, what did he do? He fell on his face and started praying for him. That's a meek person. Not get up, well, I'm going to defend myself. You have no right to say that to me. You owe me an apology. <laughs> That's pride. That is pride. Yes, it is. We don't think it's pride because it's right. They're wrong and I'm right. No. Really? Maybe God will just show you some areas where you're wrong. <laughs> Mission accomplished. We're out of here. No. Yeah, let's go. Now, Tammy, don't tempt me now. Don't use the word ice cream. That's not fair. <laughs> Glory to God. All right, where were we? Who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good lifestyle his works with meekness of wisdom. The wisdom of God is always in that place of being uh, meek, you know, or living in that place of uh, humility. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Now look at verse 14. For if, if you have 
Bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against truth. Now remember, this is set in the context of how we're using our tongue, right? right. So he's saying here that bitter envying. Now the word bitter here, bitterness means to pierce, is the, the bottom line meaning of that word. G, uh, we're warned in Scripture, not Jesus, but Paul, we're warned in Paul's writings that to beware of a root of bitterness. A root, when you plant a seed in the ground, that seed starts, it dies, and then it begins to bring forth life. And the first thing that happens is that it, a root pierces the ground. And once there's a root, then there's the capability of nurturing, nutrition, and water, and all that coming to the root to begin to cause the plant to grow. And the further it goes along, if it gets that real strong root, it's a lot harder to pull out or get rid of than if it never had a root. So he's saying here that bitterness is, you know, bitter. If, if, if I have something against you, unforgiveness, or I'm mad, I'm angry, or something about something, uh, then I, if I allow that thing to stay in my heart and stay in the ground of my heart long enough, it's going to form a root, and it's going to be a whole lot harder to change it. Actually, eventually, it'll renew your mind to where you even have to renew your mind out of it. So he says, if you have bitter envying, the word envying here is the word Z-E-L-O-S, zealous. It's the Greek word that we get the word zealous from. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. Zealous. Zealous. It, it means to be, you know, to burn against, in this context, against get upset and you start having this anger against you begin to burn against you begin to become zealous in a wrong way against someone it says let's read it again for where i'm sorry if you have bitter envying and strife the word strife actually means to work or struggle against it means to separate yourself from it's the, the word heretic is is uh, what this is about. A heretic is someone who instead of cooperating in love and flowing in his position or her position with the body of Christ, they actually begin to separate themselves from the body because they've got this bitterness in them, this attitude, this wrong attitude, and wrong heart. See, you could even be right in what you're thinking, but your attitude could be wrong about it. That's why we're told, speak truth in love. Have the motivation of love. Love's the only safe place for us. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, he says, glory not. In other words, don't get this pharisaical big head. I'm, you know, I have the gift of immaculate perception. It's how John Purcell sees it. And everybody else in the body of Christ needs to agree with John Purcell. Right? Glory not and lie not against the truth. See, what James is saying here is he's showing us how the process of how the enemy will come in and he will cause us to deceive our own heart with lies. And we can actually be growing a crop that is a curse instead of a blessing. And he told us before this in chapter 3 here, one way you'll recognize that is you've got bitter water and sweet water coming out of your mouth. Now, now and then, we're going to get under pressure. I was walking around my bedroom last night trying to get back in bed in the dark. That's never a wise thing to do. And I got my big toe and the toe next to it, the cord from a fan went right between my toes. And when I hit the end of that cord, I went, whoa, like this. Thank God the bed was right here or my face would have went right into the nightstand. And you know, something came out of my mouth that I didn't know I was going to say. Thank God my wife was asleep. That's a great visual, huh? Well, I'm glad you're edified by it. Praise God. What did you say, Pastor? None of your business. I've already taken care of it with the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Now, something like that happens to all of us now and then. But if we're going around... And we're, oh, hallelujah, glory to God, I love you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, Lord. Oh. And then over here we're going, 
sister so and so, brother so and so, well, I don't know why this, well, I don't know why that. That, see, doing that all the time and trying to do this all the time, that doesn't work. You're deceiving your own heart, and your faith will not work for you. Shandai. Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is what? What's there? Confusion. That's what we're talking about tonight, right? There's confusion and every evil work. You see, our nation's a perfect example of that. The more the rhetoric is elevated and the more the attack, you know, the, the stone throwing and the words and the name calling and the accusations and all, of, the more that goes, what's happening? The more confusion there is out there. Like I was saying earlier, People don't even know what sex they are. That's confused. You know, you, you, you watch that and you go, you know, I mean, you, you want to say, well, how can you be that dumb? They're not trying to be dumb. They're confused. Yeah. There's literally a demonic spirit of confusion that has convinced them that that's truth. Yeah. And you and I are the answer to that. We are to bless those that curse us. Pray for those that persecute us. Why? Just because we're supposed to be nice and walk in love? No, because the power of blessing is so much greater than the enemy's lies. And if I will bless somebody, you know, when somebody attacks me, I've taught myself to say, Father, I ask you to help them find your will, plan, and purpose for their life, and I bless them in the name of Jesus. Satan, you're a liar. I'm not going to let you use your lies on them anymore. And just pray for them and bless them. The Bible says when you do that, you are heaping coals of fire on their head. The fire of God begins to come on their life to purge out and drive out all that stuff that's deceiving them and hurting them. So they can come into the knowledge of the truth. Listen, Paul, uh, you know, he didn't write this book or this letter, but Paul wrote a lot about this kind of stuff. He was an expert on this. He was a religious Pharisee, and, you know, he was operating in that spirit of strife and hatred and confusion. He was completely fighting against the plan of God and didn't know it. He was living under that spirit of confusion. And I'm convinced, although we don't have specific words in the Bible to say it, that the church remembered what Jesus taught them about people like that. And they began to bless him. They began to pray for him. They began to... Do what Jesus said. And one day, because God knew that Paul was sincere, but sincerely wrong. Just like a lot of people in our nation right now. Amen. I'm not saying there aren't some that know what they're doing and they're doing it purposely. God will, de will deal with them. He gave Jezebel room to repent. And then there came a day when he said, that's it. You let God handle that. He can handle it. Amen. Amen. But the church began to pray for Paul, and one day Jesus showed up and said, Paul, why are you attacking me? And you know the whole story about that. But it, 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 he undid that because the church responded in the right way. You know, we've got to get, <laughs> we've got to be that way with each other. It's amazing how we can be so compassionate for people in the world and then attack each other in the church. <laughs> Moving right along since that went over big, amen? Amen. Praise God. Where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. Now, verse 17, let's close with this. But the wisdom, everybody say wisdom. wisdom. That is from where? Above. Above. Is first pure. Now, the word <clears throat> pure here means clean, innocent, modest. See, God has wisdom for you in every situation. If you'll ask him for wisdom, he'll give you his wisdom. Over in James chapter 1, it talks about when you fall into a test, trial, or a temptation, and you're in a pressured situation, if you'll ask God for wisdom of how to handle that, he'll give it to you. Now, his wisdom may be, don't do anything, just keep your eyes on me. Because he's already got angels in motion, he's already got things working, he's got things happening. But he'll give you wisdom. It says the wisdom, which is from above, 
See, it's not polluted. It's not mixed. It doesn't have confusion in it. It's clean. It's innocent. It's modest. It's peaceable. Now, peaceable means, see, and he's talking about having a hard attitude here. Peaceable means to be easily pacified. I remember one, one friend of mine, he was always trying to tell me what to do in life, how to pastor the church. You know, he's always trying to tell me. He never would listen to me if I gave him advice, but he was always telling, trying to tell me. He was a Christian. He was a Christian. Amen? And he would say things like this. I know I'm hard to deal with. Well, why are you hard to deal with? It's because you're not peaceable. You're a know-it-all. You're self-deceived. And, and I'm not throwing rocks at him, but uh, just, I'm just giving you an example. He was. And he, was, he would attack other Christians and even a minister I know about certain things and just talk about how bad that was. And you know what? He turned right around and did the exact same thing that minister did. It's like Brother Hagin when some, one minister ran off with the piano player or something or secretary at the church in the denomination he was in. These other ministers were having this meeting, at, uh, this uh, pastor's meeting, and they were chewing this guy up and spitting him out. And Brother Hagin said, I knew better than to get in that. And he said that one guy asked me, because somebody said, did that really happen? And somebody said, Brother Hagin, that did happen, didn't it? He, he said, well, I just said, well, yeah, it did happen. He said, that's all I said. That night he said he went to bed, turned the light off, and the whole limp, room lit up with the glory of God. And he heard a voice, an audible voice of God say, who are you to judge another man's servant? That's a scripture. And he said he knew exactly what he was talking. And he said, he thought, well, uh, Lord, now I, I didn't say, and he just kept said, the Lord just kept saying, who are you to judge another man's servant? Who are you? And the scriptures say that it's by God he'll cause him to stand or fall. And then he said, once he said, okay, Lord, forgive me. I, if I, my heart was wrong in that and I shouldn't have participated in that at all, I repent. And he said, then the Lord spoke to him and said this. For all you know, you would have done worse than he did if you were in the same circumstance and pressures he was in. See, we're not as smart as we think we are sometimes. Yeah. Hallelujah. See, what's this about tonight? This is how to keep confusion out of your life. Yeah. It's how to keep you from a place where you're confused and don't know you're confused. Right. Yeah. The wisdom which is from above is first pure and peaceable. See, people that are peaceable are easily pacified. They're looking to make peace. They're not looking to win the argument. Yeah. You ever have people call you on the phone you've had maybe a little words with or whatever? And well, I'm giving you an opportunity to apologize to me. They don't want to make peace. They want to be right. They want to win the argument. They don't want to find the place of love and peace and fellowship and koinonia. They want to be right. They want to win the argument. That's pride. Yeah. P-R-I-D-E. Pride. pride. Gentle, it says. The word gentle here means easy to be entreated or good for persuasion. They're compliant. Not compromising. But they're looking for a way to make this work, not a way to be right and everybody needs to treat me right yeah. and do what I say. See, that's true unity. Yeah. That's true unity. Amen. Yeah. That's true unity. And that's how to keep confusion out of your life. Now, verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness. Everybody say fruit. fruit. See, he's wanting us to bear fruit. Good things to happen. See, you're going to have to. It, he's, the fruit of, of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. People say, I, I pray for peace. You don't have to pray for peace. It's already in you. You got it when you got born again. You got the peace of God. Well, I pray for joy. You don't have to pray for it. It's already in you. You need to grow joy. You need to manifest joy. You need to believe what's in you and start speaking it forth and acting upon it by faith and praising God for it and exercising it like we're talking about tonight in this. And the fruit that's right, the righteous fruit of God, the fruit of the Spirit that's sown in peace. See, we sow this seed in peace where the blessed are the peacemakers, 
we're walking in this thing in love and we're, not, we're refusing to let confusion come in and take over. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus said, every kingdom that's divided will fall. A house divided will not stand. You can be divided against yourself. You won't stand. You'll fall. That's just the truth. I'm not trying to scare anybody or make anybody feel bad. But what I'm saying is, is he's given us a way here and showing us some wisdom here that if we take the high road, I guess, you you know, is the old way of saying it. If we refuse to bite on the devil's hook, if we, you know, if, if I'm so insecure that I have to be right all the time, man, I need to grow up. I need to grow up. Amen? I don't care if it... it, I'm going to do what's right concerning concerning other people. I'm going to love them. I'm going to forgive them. I didn't say I wanted to. I didn't say my flesh uh, wouldn't lust after punching them in the nose. (laughs) And if I did punch them in the nose, I would go to them and apologize and repent and ask God to forgive me. Amen? I'm not letting the devil in. I'm not going to be divided against me. I'm not going to confuse my own heart and sow the seeds of discord and confusion in my life. The Bible says in Ephesians, give no place to the devil. Now, if God tells John Purcell he's to give no place to the devil, he must have made a way for me to do that. And what we've seen tonight is that, that way. Just refuse to be a part of it, of what the enemy's doing. I'm going to bless. I may have to do it with my teeth gritted at first because my flesh is having a flesh party, a flesh fit, a hissy fit, they used to call it from where I'm from. But I'm going to do it and do it anyway. I had to do that when I first moved up here. There was a situation happened between me and another Christian, and the things that were done, you know... If somebody comes after me, it doesn't bother me that much. But when they hurt my family, (laughs) and we're all that way, I think. You know, it's that natural protective instinct for your family and all that. But, you know, I I went to the Lord. (laughs) I had at least enough understanding to go to the Lord. And I said, Lord, what is this? He said, this is the enemy trying to discredit you in Madeira before you ever get started. It had, he didn't mention, well, this is that person, that Christian, and they're in the flesh, and they're doing you wrong, and I'm going to get them. And, uh, he didn't even talk about that person. He said, it's the devil. Whoever the devil's working through, he's working through. Whether it's an ignorant Christian, or it's some sinner, or, or it's your own brain and your life, or whatever. He's, that's, he, knows, he, goes, he cuts to the chase. He gets to the root cause. And so I made up my mind because I already knew what to do. I was taught what to do in the church I'd come out of. God had you know, used Brother Hagin to teach me and so forth. And I made up my mind, every time I think of that man, I am going to bless him. And I even told the devil, I said, you bring him up a lot, he's going to get a lot of prayer and a lot of blessing. You keep bringing that, because that's what the devil will do. What, look what he did to you. Look what he did. Boy, if I was you, I'd do this. If I was you, I'd do that. And then when that doesn't work, then he says, why don't you just quit the ministry? Look what God let happen in your life. Yeah. And we have to make a decision. And at first I said, I bless him in the name of Jesus. Because yeah. I was upset. My emotions were hurting. I was angry. I was mad. And I, and I tried not to be that way, but you're offended. You're wounded. You're, you're hurt. Right. But I didn't just nurture my hurt with self-pity. Poor John, just trying to serve God, and the devil came after him. And he used brother so-and-so. Kenneth Hagin, when he was dying as a teenager on his bed, 17 years old, and he just said, God, it just doesn't seem right. And he, he told, you know, he went to the Lord and he said, here's this guy down the street down here. He's making money off of drugs and illegal gambling. He's got a new car. It was during the Depression. He's got a new car. He's got all the money he needs. He's got a healthy body, and here I am. I'm your child. I'm laying here, and I'm dying. And the doctor said, I don't have a one in a million chance of living past my 18th birthday. It just doesn't seem right. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and says, well, the answer's in my word. In other words, he was telling him, get in the word, and I'll teach you. I'll give you some wisdom. 
But then he also told them, he said, you got to get out of this self-pity thing. Self-pity is a pit. It's a sewer. It's a deceptive trap. It feels so good to your flesh. Poor me. Pet my flesh. Everybody's against me. Nobody likes me. Yeah, eat some worms, yeah. But it's, it's deceptive. Yeah. It's a lie from hell. Yeah. It's setting you up for a big fall. Yeah. And he said, the Lord told him, says, you're going to have to deal with self-pity. Now think about that. Teenager, born with deformed heart, blood diseases. Never, he used to say it this way, never could run and play like other little children. He said, I'd just sit there and be amazed at how kids could run back and forth and play when I was growing up. He said, if I tried to do that and my heart wasn't beating right, I'd pass out. All of his life that way. And he's telling the Lord, this ain't right. And God says, I can make it right. Get in the word, but you're going to have to get out of self-pity. You can't have your eyes on you and have your eyes on God at the same time. You can't have your eyes on the devil and have your eyes on other people that are being used to the devil and God at the same time. Hallelujah. See, God wants us to stay out of confusion. Even though the world is in this big tornado of confusion right now, we don't have to be a part of that. And when we're not confused, guess what we're going to be? We're going to be the answer. We're going to have the wisdom to help others. We're going to have that anointing on our lives to bless others and show them you don't have to live in that. You don't have to be tormented by demons your whole life in your mind. Amen. This help you tonight? Praise God. Let's just stand and pray. Glory. God, you are good. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your knowledge. Thank you, Father God, that we can be zealous in a right way. We see where the Apostle Paul, once he got it figured out, once he submitted himself to you, he's the one that wrote a lot about this in the Word and told us, you got to walk in the love of God. That's where the freedom is. Even in manifestations of power, it must come from my love. So, Father, I thank you for these that have been here tonight and these that have watched over the Internet, someone maybe that might watch this at a later date. Lord, I pray that as we meditate on these scriptures, as we embrace the truth, the righteous truth of your word, as we yield to your process of helping us to move into that place of peace, being a peacemaker, using that powerful force of peace that stops storms, that drives fear out of a room and off of the disciples. God, I thank you that we are those who bring this peace into a confused world. And those, Lord, uh, that have been confused by all of the stuff that's been purported as wisdom in our society, Over the last 70 years, God, I thank you that as you unravel all of that and as you reveal it for what it is, God, help us to have the answer. Not just say, here's the problem, but help us to be that answer in the peace and the love of God to others. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Have a great week. Go out and minister a little peace to somebody. Amen?